In the previous videos, we went over weighted average cost of capital, and I said that the hardest uh, number to find is the return required by investors, or the R equity. So in this video, we're going to use the capital asset pricing model shown here to find the value for R equity. So quickly going over the equation, the return required by investors on common stock equals the risk-free rate, which is U.S. Treasury bonds, the yield on U.S. Treasury bonds, plus the beta equity, which is a measure of the stock's volatility or the stock's market risk, essentially how sensitive the stock is to fluctuations in the market. So let's assume that company X has a beta equity of 2.0. So if the market increases by 5%, on average, that company's stock will increase by 10%. If the market decreases by 2%, that company's stock will decrease by 4%. It's the beta equity is the volatility times the increase or decrease in the market will give you on average how that stock performs. And then we times this by the return on the market, which is the average return of the market, usually a index fund or numerous index funds put together minus the risk-free rate. And this, these two numbers in brackets put together are the market risk premium. So we can see here, we've got a table of a survey of a bunch of managers to see what they tend to use as their market risk premium. And uh, in the United States, you can see it's 5.5 with a fairly high standard deviation. And in Canada, it's 5.9. <clears throat> Excuse me, again, fairly high standard deviation. So first, let's look at our risk-free rates. And this, all you need to do is go to U.S. Treasuries. Now, which bond should we use? Well, that again is fairly debatable. Ask your manager because they may have a preference. But what I like to do is if the project I am proposing or analyzing is expected to last three years, well, let's use a three-year rate. Ten years, use the ten-year rate. So let's say our project is expected to last ten years. So I will use a yield of 2.25%. So our risk-free rate will be 2.25%. And now the average market return. Now consensus is that it's around 7%. I used S&P data from 2011 to, to 1950 and you can see that the annual annualized average return again this is in percentage return is uh, 8.2 percent now probably a more accurate uh, description of kind of today's expectations might be 1990 to present and so there we've got 7.7% uh, and then we just want to kind of ignore that like every other investor. And so what we'll do is we'll just use 7.7% for our average market return. And now to find the beta equity. There are, again, numerous ways to find the beta equity. One way is to go on to uh, finance websites. You can see here we've got a beta of 1.13, shows the market volatility. And then down here we've got a, a beta of 0.85. 
and then this is on Yahoo Finance. And then on Reuters, we have a beta of 1.1. So, you know, these are pretty different because I don't really know which method they're using, so I'm just going to calculate it myself. Now, to find the beta equity, what you need is the adjusted at least weekly closes. Uh, you could do daily closes of the stock in question, Amazon.com, and the uh, index or the market you are comparing it to. Now, to find the percentage change, the formula is the most recent close divided by the later close minus one. And right now we'll just drag this down and of course you can drag it down all the way. Now to find you always kinda wanna graph out the adjusted closes to see if you can see any patterns. I used from uh, present to 2005 Amazon's been public since 98. Should I go all the way back to 98? Well, since I see a pretty significant pattern here, I would make the case that the most realistic uh, evaluation of investor expectations is probably from point uh, approximately 150 to present. If I were to include this data, it might just create noise that's not really an accurate reflection of current conditions. So now to the formula of beta equity. This beta equity equals covariance of the stock versus the market returns divided by the variance of the market. So when I input my covariance, the array one is going to be the stock, and the second array is going to be the market. And then we just divide this by the variance of the market, which is a single array. And um, so this is one way of doing it, just inputting it into Excel. However, that will return me a beta, and I will not know if the results are statistically significant, what the confidence intervals are, so I highly recommend doing a regression analysis on these two sets of data. Now for those of you that don't know regression analysis, I will explain this in more detail later, but we can get all our stats that we need from this regression analysis. We have our uh, covariation here, our adjusted covariation, we can see that our regression analysis is significant and that our t-stats are significant too. And so we have here our coefficient is the beta. So we have a beta of 1.135 and uh, we've got our confidence limits and all that here. So now we'll go back to our formula here, and we have a beta of 1.135, and now we just have to input our numbers, which is the risk-free rate plus the beta equity times the market risk premium or the return of the market minus the risk-free rate. And that gives us a return required by investors of 8.4%. Now, when we put this in to our weighted average cost of capital, this gives us a company-wide weighted average cost of capital. A company-wide weighted average cost of capital is not very useful for conglomerates when proposing specific products. If the company focuses on one business, the weighted average cost of capital 
the company-wide WAC can be used in NPV calculations. If the company is a conglomerate, we will have to use a different discount rate. And that, my friends, will be for another video. Okay, hope this helped. Thanks for watching.